I think you need to turn the thing on. It's not oh. switch on the top. What crazy technology is that? Turn on? Wait, wait, Amazing. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, most of you probably already heard me talk before, so yeah. You know who I am. Um, for everyone else, I'm a JavaScript developer who's been writing code for seven, eight, ten, I don't know. So many years, many years. It's all been JavaScript the whole time. So that obviously modifies my perspective. Um, I met a lot of developers because I've never come from like, oh, this is how you do it in C sharp. Okay, I'm going to bring that over to JavaScript. Or this is how I've done it in Java. Or this is how I've done it in Ruby, etc. <coughs> so that has an impact on how I write code. And as part of that, um, one thing that's been happening a lot lately is with ES6, ES7, ES5, some of that stuff. Uh, basically, everyone went, oh my god, JavaScript's amazing. I better write C sharp in it. Or whatever, you know, different language in the, in JavaScript. So there's all these new features that are that either don't make sense in JavaScript or they're like poorly, like they don't, they don't really fit very well or they're just syntactic sugar, etc. cetera. Um, so I think there's some really good things in the new spec, um, like you've got uh, destructuring assignment, um, like rest parameters, less and stuff, really like those things. So certain things that you can't do, uh, like in ES5, you have weak maps and sets and all that kind of stuff. That you can't, even, you can't implement them uh, very well anyway uh, by yourself. <clears throat> but there are a lot of things that I'm not a fan of. One of those things is promises. Um, who here doesn't know what promises are? Okay, yep. So promises are, yep. <laughs> <laughs> promises are a, actually, you know what's better than that? Yeah, no. <clears throat> I'll, I'll let Mozilla tell you what a promise is because I wouldn't even know how to describe it myself. Because I'd call it a utility, but I'm sure they have like some fancy way of saying it. It's an object used for asynchronous computations. Ooh, that sounds fancy. A promise represents an operation that hasn't completed yet but is expected in the future. Wow. Sounds amazing. How do we do this? Oh, look, a chart. Things. Oh my God, so much documentation. Okay, so what promises really do is almost nothing. They have, they, they, they literally like do almost nothing at all. It's, it's ridiculous. Okay, so let me just jump right in. Here is an asynchronous task. You have a database connection, for example, you wanna make two users, each one has an address and a profile, object, whatever you wanna call it, model in the database, role in the database. You want to asynchronously, asynchronously create as much stuff in parallel as possible. So for example, before you make your users, you need to make each one's address and profile, preferably at the same time, get them back, assign their IDs to the thing, create the user, and move on. <clears throat> um, I'm locked up a little database here. It's pretty simple. Uh, all 91 lines of it. Um, so let's go create, find, update, remove, find all. You know, the standard stuff you see on most database -y type of stuff. <clears throat> And you can see what it's like to do that in JavaScript with nearest makes no difference, no libraries. Um, I am actually using Parallel, which is just like, if anyone's ever used like async or Parallel or whatever, it's pretty much that. It's just like, here's some tasks, you do them at the same time, tell me when they're done. Um, but yeah, basically, if we go to the bottom, we go in Parallel, create the first user and create the second user. So create the first user is in Parallel, create an address for the user, create a profile for the user. I'm just like inlining the data because you can see it. <clears throat> Once they're done, create a user using results, <laughs> what like the first result and the second result, which just happens to be the address and the profile. So that's good that that works. It's not very readable, obviously. Anyway, I can do that twice because you know you need two users, and that'll work, um, which I'll run in a second. So that's that's like fairly raw JavaScript to do that, and it's really not very pretty, which is fair enough. So what people usually do is they use a, little help, a couple of libraries like um, async, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> although async is very rigid, and I think this is why people really jump on promises. Um, 
async, actually, I'll do it by asking again. Who here hasn't heard of async.js? Okay, so async.js, very simple. It's just like utilities to do certain asynchronous operations, like do these things in parallel, or do these things in order, or waterfall these so that you get the results of the previous one, etc. Um, but it's very rigid in like, you have one task to do one thing in one way, which normally I like functions that do one thing, but in this case, it just kind of like does an arbitrarily rigid thing in that you can't just say like, I need to make two things and then once they're done, make another thing. You have to just like do things in order or do things at the same time and get all of them in an array, you know, that sort of stuff. So that was a bit tedious because that kind of ends up looking quite a lot like this. Obviously you can break this out into name functions, which will neaten it up a lot, but you're still gonna have a pretty messy flow. <laughs> so then promises came along. Uh, promises were a thing from some other language that's not JavaScript, I don't know. Were they in Ruby or, I don't know, who's, who, does anyone here know where promises came from? Small talk. What's that? Small talk. What's that? No, I'm just making that up. <laughs> 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 I don't remember the thing. I think they might have Yeah, okay. I don't know, maybe they just like appeared out of the mist and never left. Anyway, so <laughs> this is how you might do this. If, for example, you have a standard callback passing style database, <coughs> which takes a query, for example, and a callback, where find all, query, callback, find all the items in the database that match the query, and calls back with either an error or results. And that's for like all your create, find, update, etc. So if you have that, that's a, that's, a, that's a sort of syntax, that's a pattern that's been around for a very long time for doing asynchronous code. Um, you'll see if you like in the browser for the last 10 years, you've got, you know, add event listener, mouse move, and you get a callback that gets an event when it moves. Um, in that case, mouse moves can't error, so you don't get an error. Um, uh, Ajax, uh, people have written, like in jQuery, they did the Ajax thing where you go like make a request and you get error result or et cetera. That sort of thing. <clears throat> so that's pretty standard. If you would like to use promises with that, it looks like this, which is horrible. <laughs> because promises don't play nicely with anything other than promises. So promises, the, the, the API for promise is you go new promise, you get a function that has resolve and reject. You do some asynchronous code inside the promise. If it worked, you call resolve with the result. If it didn't work, you call reject with the error or the reason it didn't work. So because like everything up until promises was you get a callback with error result. To split that up, you've got to go Okay, do my callback passing style in the callback if error, return, reject error, otherwise resolve, result. So that's like, that's how you just like make an address with a promise if you're using callback passing style stuff. Unless someone can correct me, because I'm, I'm like, I feel like this is horribly wrong because it's so bad. So I feel like <laughs> I've just screwed it up or it's either I've screwed it up or it's actually this bad. I don't really know which one it is. Unless the API is already promise based. That's correct. <laughs> so. You come along and go, okay, well that's that's the worst. Why would you want to do that? Yes, it's like slightly stepped out more than than vanilla stuff. Like that's pretty ugly, but it's 70 lines of code versus 94 lines of code for a better solution, I guess. Yeah. So people go, oh, that's cool. Just um, library developers will implement promises and then you can consume them. So in this case, I've got my DB that does the callback passing style. You go, okay, we'll wrap that API in a promise API. So here's the code to do that. <clears throat> it's, it's nearly 80 lines of code. And it goes through all your models and tacks on, it replaces, it creates a new object with like create, find, update, remove, and remove all, uh, find all um, methods that rather than using callback passing style, they return promises that resolve when they're complete. And with that, you get a much, much nicer usage. So all 46 lines of code. Now you say address one is create, and that returns a promise, so address one's a promise. And then address two, which is a promise, profile one, profile two. So these happen, these execute straight away, and they're in flight by like the next line pretty much. And they will eventually resolve. So and then we go, okay, <clears throat> I need both address one and profile one to create user one. So I join these two promises with a like a combiner function, which can return a promise. So in this case, I go create user one data, it takes address profile, then it returns the promise from the create, create 
name, address one, profile one, etc. And save it to. And then I want both of those to happen in parallel and I want both of the results. So I go promise that all, then result callback, and all result catch callback. Because, yeah, of course, at some point you've got to go back to just getting the data. And at that point, this is your API to do that. So yeah, that's that's the um, that the cool promisey way. As far as I can tell, again, I'm not a promise professional um, by choice, um, but I can see why coming from this, that's pretty terrible. And going to this, people are saying, "Oh, it's good. You can say, okay, make address one, make address two, make profile one, make profile two. It just kind of reads out nicely." I've never liked promises though because I don't like the API. I don't like the fact that they catch thrown errors, and I don't like the fact that they're in the spec. This is a simple, extremely simple, little async helper function that we are now baking into the language because people happen to like it today. It's going to be in there forever, just like every other stupid quirk that's in JavaScript. Like, this is just so obvious, I don't even understand how anyone can think it should be in the spec, whatever. Everyone can have their own opinion, of course, but my opinion is that they definitely shouldn't be in the spec because you should be able to implement them in a couple hundred lines of code maximum. And then you, you know, import your library and you use them. And the thing is people say, oh, well, then you've got like, you know, all this code that's in your, in your project and therefore it like slows it down. Okay, but currently you need that any, it, uh, anyway because the spec isn't, up to date with what people, how people want to use it. So this join thing doesn't even exist in the spec. So you can't do that. Currently, if you want to do that, you do promise.all and then grab it by like a ray reference because Bluebird implements that and other libraries implement that, but native promises don't implement that. So it doesn't even work already. So you already, actually, that's a good point. I'm going to show you something that's going to be interesting. So what you're importing, if you're doing this on the client side, <clears throat> I just feel like I'm just ripping up promises. I kind of am. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. It's not really what I'm here for, but I mean, it always ends up like that anyway. So when you import, when you go require Bluebird, for example, you get promise.js. which is loading. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so that's, that's, prom that's, that's promise.js. You'll notice down here you've got require method, bind, canceled, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of requires in here because not only is it that file, you also get every one of these files, which are also extraordinarily huge. So yeah, you, you pretty much just, a couple of kilobytes just straight up. Thanks, Mark Wiser. Anyway, so my solution to this, uh, slash my approach to this was kind of make my own version, as I always do, as everyone who knows me. Um, now, I like the idea of being able to go with promises. You go, yeah, make a thing and eventually it'll be done, make a thing eventually be done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you just use them when, you, when they're done. And by the end, you just get either the result or it didn't work yet. Now I feel I kind of like that. So I recreated that API, sort of, with a model like called Rhino. Um, now, Rhino has a very similar syntax to promises. In fact, if I click over to the Rhino version of the same code using the standard callback passing database, you'll see that it's just slightly shorter than the promise implementation. So there's it. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, there's your promise one, 46 lines of code. There's your righto version, 42 lines of code. The only difference actually in length is this line, which is just a touch shorter. Everything else is almost exactly the same. Same length, same everything. The API is almost exactly the same. You say righto, call create with this argument, and eventually you'll have address one. When you go, I want address one, you can just go address one, get the callback error result. And you got it. That will you'll eventually get that value, whatever you want it, basically. And then, if you need one of those values as a dependency of another task, for example, you just pass them as parameters. So this way, this is a function. Create user one data 
takes address, profile, and a, like a callback basically. So I'm saying, righto, do that with address one and profile one. Because these are rightos, righto under the covers, we'll wait until they result, pass the results in, and run the function. So it's quite similar to promises. Uh, as an example comparison between uh, file size, I'll open up the entire implementation of righto. That's it. Uh, has 149 lines of code. So that'll minify down to who cares the amount of size. It's so small. Um, and as far as I can tell, and again, I'm not a promise expert, but as far as I can tell, it has slightly more features than promises, and it has about twice the performance of them. And it's about equivalent to native promises, which don't work because it doesn't they don't implement half the stuff that you want to use, or about twice as fast as Bluebird, for example, for the same task. <coughs> um, and the cool thing about this is, because it just uses callbacks everywhere, this is not using its own version of the database. This is just using the standard vanilla database thing with standard callbacks, because that's how it's, it's like natively works. That's how it's supposed to work. So you can just call a, pass the callback that it takes at the top straight into the results. So you don't have to do like wacky, you know, this weird stuff just to get it out. See, the thing with promises is you kind of go from like how everything works to uh, how everything works in promises. While you're in there, it's okay. And then you go, oh, I gotta go back out into how everything actually works again. So you kind of like drop into this like different reality while you're doing it. And while you're there, it's great. And then you have to drop back out of it into like standard land. And that's when it all falls apart. Or at least gets very painful. Um, as an example, I made uh, the same solution with a write hoed database. So the code to write -ho a database is that. Uh, just iterates through it and replaces it with a call to the same function with righto. And it looks almost exactly the same, which means you can go db.address.create and that returns a righto, similar to the promise version. If you look at the promise database version, you got exactly the same thing, looks almost identical. The only difference is at the end, really. So there's that one, and there's the righto one. This is the only difference here, you call righto with the parameters instead of calling promise.join. So almost the same API. Now, that's all well and good, cool. It does the same job, so what's the point? Give it a go, let's go install stuff, because I forgot to before I started this. Luckily it's small. Okay, so there you go, you can see it's all working and that sort of stuff. Um, just trust me, it works. Um, <laughs> so what it's doing is it's going, uh, requires the vanilla file, promise database file version, write version, promise version, etc. blah, 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 blah. Runs them all um, in series, so it runs one in the next one, etc. Times how long they took and uh, logs the error if it has an error. They're not going to error because my database connection is in memory to my file, so it's not going to fail. So yep, and you can see here, so the vanilla call took six milliseconds, the promise of five database took 14 milliseconds, the righto database of five one took five, the promise is six, righto four. And yes, that will change over time, but relatively consistently, equivalent types, righto beats promises every time, or pretty much every time. There are some wacky things that happen every now and again, but generally, it's faster across the board. In fact, it's the same as vanilla, pretty much. So that's all good. Right now, not really a big difference in terms of like selling it, except that if I go into, for example, my promise code, and I'm in here, and I just like go things, and I run that, it'll uh, work. My code worked. I just called things out of nowhere. Stuff. These are not functions. Cool, so, my, my, so let's just say this is on my production server. And I just like hit random keys to have a completely broken piece of code, server just stays up. Might get some 500s. You gonna see that? I don't know, who reads logs? Literally, put your hands up, go on. Exactly. You'll never see that. So you've just got like code that's completely broken. You that will never ever go past that code. It's totally, small children can't say it. <laughs> totally ruined. 
what's the difference between that and just straight up rejecting? There is no difference. You can't tell unless you actually inspect the like the error object in the result. You gotta like go, oh, okay, no, that was like, a, I type, I hit the keyboard, a, a cat walked across the keyboard and my code's totally broken versus, oh, the database went down. They're the same, like who cares? And this is, I think, the biggest critical point. If I do the same thing in Rhino, bang, crash the server, you, your cat walked across the keyboard. Don't commit the code, etc. Like, the I'll fact, I'll buy one. <laughs> the fact <laughs> that promises gobble er, thrown errors, I, I actually don't understand how anyone gets across that. People are like, eh, just don't worry about it, don't have errors. What? Have you written code in your life? They're gonna happen. You, you don't want your production service to be in a state that you don't know that they're like that you're that you're unsure of. If your if your code is not working and like obviously not working how it's supposed to, don't just let your service stay up. You could be leaking users' data, you could be transit like you know, processing transactions that you shouldn't be processing. If something's wrong and you know it's wrong, crash the server, restart the server. Get rid of all the stuff you've got there, don't continue. Promises destroy that. It doesn't matter where your code is, if a promise is pretty much like anywhere in the stack, nah, caught. It's like one of the biggest problems we have at work is we deal with SQLize, and SQLize is all Bluebird promises. And if we if we throw an error in a completely unrelated piece of code in the system, it'll almost always get caught by Bluebird promises and we'll just get 500. Even code where we're saying, oh, this is a configuration problem, we haven't even passed the right configuration, maybe we're publishing shit that we shouldn't be doing, throw, Bluebird will be like, yeah, 500. Now that database is just sitting there online, totally not correct because it, ugh, we can't bring down our own servers where we want to. So frustrating. Anyway, so I'm like a little bit passionate about this, if you may have noticed. But yeah, I mean, that's that's really that's really it. Um, it Rado's promises that the file size is drastically smaller, the performance is about double. If you throw, it actually throws and trash the server. Has a couple more features, as far as I can tell. Doesn't depend on a spec that's not even finalized yet. Yep, that's it. Complaints? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've expressed them all. <laughs> um, yeah, so, it's available, it's a module, so like if I change the spec, you'll get the new version and we'll see the breaking changes, etc. Um, we're using it in production on a number of projects. It's going good, it's had cash go through it, like actual real money transactions. So it's pretty solid, tested. Please use it. How big is your user community for a writer at the moment? About three people. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you mean end user, and then about a thousand people at the moment. Okay. That's people like using some code that's produced using Writer? Yeah, a thousand or more at the moment. Um, growing a lot. Uh, actual developer, hands on code, maybe five, yeah, three to five people, I would think. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? No? Nah? Cool. That was, everyone knows it now. All right, so because I definitely went under time, um, I, d I did see that, you know, um, serverless, JAWS? Yep. So when it emulates the AWS environment on your development machine, it runs it all inside a promise. Oh, good. And so it would cause these asynchronous errors when my code had exited after it had finished. That's really that's kind of good. weird error. Yeah. That sounds really good. So I totally get that whole promises thing, <laughs> swallowing the errors. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Um, so yeah, what I was gonna do other than that was uh, do a recap of CamJS, which I didn't go to. <laughs> but instead, myself and a couple other people got together on a weekend and just <laughs> drank scotch and did our own thing. And that was fun, so I'll just show you this, which might be completely broken. It looks like, no, it's good. Cool, so this is what I did on the weekend. It's, this is like, I don't know what state this is in because I don't have the latest code, I think it's on a different computer. Whatever, this is pretty close. You're a pathogen. <laughs> they are T-cells. Don't die. That's the game. Uh, it's much harder than you think it is. It's like a lot harder, actually. Um, oh, God. <laughs> They're like super guys. And, oh, Jesus. 
there are super ones and there are like normal ones and uh, the terrain is randomly generated as are the enemies. <clears throat> Can you kill the host? No, uh, no, that may be a feature later. Uh, I'm not really sure. So I don't know, I'm gonna just like play with this and ooh, okay, they look mean. <laughs> Uh, those guys, the, the big yellowy looking orange ones, do 30% health if they hit you. You got so. much better at this game. Oh yeah, I'm, oh, I'm so oh, dead. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I've had a bit of practice. <laughs> Featuring Quest, you want to multiply it and, create, uh, and control two of them with two hands. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was thinking um, potentially the little pink things could be like, I don't know, blind cells or whatever. And maybe you get points for touching them and infecting them. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what, where to go. Or I was almost thinking maybe just like leave it pretty simple because even the extremely simple mechanics that I have here are showing people and they're like, yeah, it's kind of cool. And then like 10 minutes later, they're like, oh, I can't get better than 50 seconds, etc. So keeping it simple is kind of good too. But yeah, that was what I did for two days. That was pretty fun. Cool, I'm done now. Thanks. Oh, that's fine. It's all good. No, we can, uh, that's dead. So you can't hear me. Fine. Fine. Yeah, here we go. You can hear me. Um, we'll probably get our shout outs out, I think, at this point, because we're just waiting on pizza to arrive, which should be like in 10 minutes. So that should be good. Um, do you want to go first, Anna? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And then we can get Luke up. Cool with that? Right. <laughs> if you don't want a little presentation. Well, no, you can do it at the end. That's fine. I'm just stalling. <laughs> All yours. Go as long as you Thank like. you. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna, or you might know me as Crazy Robot Lady. Um, so I am again organising International Nodebots Day, which is on the twenty third of July. It's a Saturday, and the idea of International Nodebots Day is that we build robots and we program them using Node.js, and we, in particular, we use a library called Johnny Five that you might have heard of. That uh, is a really cool library, and we've done this for several years now. Uh, pretty much the same deal as last year. We get a whole group of people together at the edge uh, on the Saturday afternoon, all afternoon. We just have lots and lots of gear. We have uh, bulk buys, so if you want to get a robot and you haven't got some gear, you're welcome to go in and, and purchase some kit. And uh, we have plenty for you to borrow if you don't want to do that. So come along, build some robots. It'll be awesome. 23rd of July. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll let you through. Awesome. So yes, it is very worthwhile. I love going around uh, along and volunteering. It is awesome. Um, what else can I say about it? It is enriching, and you should go along. And you should definitely go in and uh, buy the uh, the robot because everyone wants to have their own gear and have a robot. And you can bring it along to the next Nerdbot day or the ne next Nerdbot meetup. And uh, you can extend it, hack on it, and come in, and then eventually you can compete on the robots. It's a different robot each year too. There you go. It's a different robot each year, if you didn't catch that. So, pretty useful stuff. Um, so, I'm thinking, while we wait for the pizza, which better show up in five minutes, um, I think we can all just have a chat. What, what's going on? Um, can I show you this? Um, I did an, uh, a little app while I was at um, uh, Camp JS. Perfect. Excellent. Come on up. Excellent. <laughs> show us your app at Camp JS. That is yours. Look yourself up. And present it to you if necessary. Beauty. See if I can hook this up and see it at the same time. So the, um, the whole thing at Camp JS, I, I've been to a few of them and uh, every other time other people have created things and uh, presented them at the Sunday night at Camp JS and I've never done that and I thought, uh -uh, this time I'm going to do it. Nice. So it started from scratch on the Friday night and when Friday afternoon when I arrived, uh, I got into Cordova and said, I need to create a Cordova app from scratch and so I created Audio Jotter. And what it is, it's a simple audio recorder, basically, you know, one of these memo takers, uh, but what it is is you can uh, split the memos into categories. Right? And the categories are 
all stored as simple folders in your um, user space so you can see them as mp3 files later yourself if you want to or you can process them using the app and so these folders are all, all ones I've created now but I can create a new one and just go in there and say uh, a new folder call it new and the colors are all uh, allocated based on a hash based on the name so you can't get to control the color but they're all color coded so you've got a bit of an idea that the you know the misc one always comes up in that yucky you know baby cat color <laughs> um, and billings always comes up in blue and that's it it's, so you when they because when you record into it it's red and now i'm recording into it tap it again and it resorts them so that the most recent one is at the top uh, so you can then go into that by tapping on it there's the recording i just did uh, you can pull that out there. Yeah, it won't play now because it's maybe it done. And now we're going to do it. didn't work at CampJS because they didn't have the sound set up correctly. Uh, uh, you can then either share it or delete it. Uh, or you can record from in here. So tap there and you can do another recording. Uh, and when you finish, you come out and there's now two. Uh, um, if you say, oh, I don't have any more, don't have bugs anymore, you can just delete that folder. It should be showing touches and it's gone. Mm. Really simple, really easy. Uh, and it's on the Play Store, but don't download it because it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> All got to do with those <clears throat> B ads at the bottom. Uh, I've got some issue with the um, AdMob uh, um, plugin on Cordova. It's refusing to do a build. <laughs> but that's pretty much it. Uh, um, one little app and um, all done in about 48 hours. Fantastic. That's awesome work. <clears throat> oh, and I won a phone for it. Sure. <laughs> what kind of phone did you win for it? I won a Sony Xperia Z3. That is not half bad at all. There you go. So you go to CampJS. Uh, hack something up and uh, win a phone and things like that. These things happen all the time and it's good. I know a whole bunch of people won Firefox phones at one point um, because they... Uh, Did you also win that? No, but the phone came from Mozilla oh. as an ex-Firefox um, uh, OS because they're shutting that down. There you that's, go. That's what it existed So it for. is from Mozilla. So there you go. They give away a bunch of phones. Um, so that way you can hack on there and do Firefox OS and do the rest of it in there, which is actually really interesting stuff. They gave away Blackberry. Yeah, they gave away Blackberries, which was really, really cool. Um, it was actually one of the uh, one of the first ones with the, um, was it the 10th operating system in there? It was like, <coughs> sorry? Z10s. Yeah. Like web-based. Yeah, the whole OS is web-based. It's kind of amazing. It had better JavaScript support than Chrome, basically, at the time, which is kind of incredible. So, um, yeah, don't discount Blackberry. They were, they were doing some good stuff. Um, and on that note, uh, let's just have some drinks and uh, the pizza should show up shortly and then we'll go uh, get cracked and cracking straight into our next presentation. Thanks everyone. All right. I will crack you. <laughs>